celebration of Poetry Month, hosted by Palm City Montpelier, as well as BCFA and their literary magazine, uh, Hunger Mountain. Issue 23 is available over there if you want to check it out. Some of the assistant editors and myself will be reading poems from the journal um, to celebrate, and we have one contributor from the journal who will be reading her own poem. Um, if anyone is inspired by all of these readings, feel free to grab a journal and read from it if you wish. It's certainly not required, and we haven't done like extensive prep or anything. This is really just meant to be a celebration of poetry. So I want to thank the sponsors, and then I'm going to tell a little story about the poem that I'm going to read um, and why I chose this one. Poem City is a presentation of the Cala Covered Library, made possible by our great sponsors. National Life Group Foundation, Vermont Humanities Council, Hunger Mountain Co-op, the other Hunger Mountain, uh, <laughs> Poetry Society of Vermont, and best of all, Vermont College of Fine Arts. So thanks to everyone for making this happen. I'm new to town, as some of you know. I've been here about eight months, and I'm really grateful that such a small town cares so much about the arts in general, um, and poetry in particular. Um, I was telling Nick that walking around Montpelier, I never once read the same poem on the Poem City broadsides, and that thrilled me that there were so many poems available to read. And I would have been happy to read some of them more than once, but that every time I paused, I was um, uh, exposed to someone's work um, that was new to me. I'm going to choose to read a poem from someone um, from home. So I'm coming here from Flagstaff, Arizona, which is right on the border of the Navajo Nation, uh, which takes up a lot of Arizona and New Mexico. And this poet, Jake Skeets, I met uh, at an indigenous writer symposium in Flagstaff, which was a, an event a couple years ago where they gathered a lot of the up and coming and most established indigenous writers from all over the nation in Flagstaff. Um, and there were panels and readings. And my first exposure to Jake Skeets was at the end of it all. He asked the, the people who'd been part of the festival, he had just been an observer, what does it feel like to be in Flagstaff? And I think my colleagues were expecting to say, like, lovely, we're so happy to be here, it's so awesome. And that's not what they said. A lot of the women said, you know, I'm nervous walking alone at night. Um, some people said, this really feels like a border town. It feels really divided between the white community and the indigenous community. Um, and someone said, yeah, you know, I have a beer here, but I'm really uh, nervous about ordering a second beer. And people think some stereotypical thoughts about me and my alcohol consumption. And it was not something anyone in the room was expecting. Um, but I'm from Flagstaff. I was born and raised. And so that felt really familiar to me, um, the, the complications of my hometown. And I was like, who's that guy that asked the question and knew what the answer would be and wanted that answer to get into the room? Um, so I went over and kind of introduced myself and um, have been friendly with Jake Skeets ever since. He's an up and coming poet that's not up and coming anymore. His book is just out from Milkweed, um, or just about to be out from Milkweed. Um, and the, what's that? September. OK, thank you, Sam. I love that you always love. <laughs> Awesome. So I ran into Jake at the most recent AWP conference, which is in Portland, Oregon. Um, we were just talking about Portland, Maine. And the cover of his book is about the, the main character in the poem that I'm going to read as well, his uncle. Um, so if you see the pre-order, um, the person who's being spoken about here is the cover of Jake's book. So um, I'm grateful to him for just the things that he's taught me. And then I'm grateful that he gets to be in the pages of Hunger Mountain. So if people like to follow along, I am going to read um, Drifter from 19. The next poem that he has with us read written into water is equally gorgeous, but a lot of it's in Diné, in Dinata, the language of the Navajo Nation, which I won't read because I would not do so um, the way it deserves to be read. So this is Drifter by Jake Skeets. The epigraph is after Benson James Drifter. Route 66, Gallup, New Mexico, 1979. By Richard Abaddon. Drift. To drift is to be carried by current of air or water. But men are not the teeth of their verbs. They pry nouns open with a belt buckle to take a sip. Drifter. A drifter carried by a current of air or water makes his way from one place to another. See vagabond, see transient, see drunk. See a man with shoulder length hair, dollar bills fisted, standing before a white screen. See his lips, how still, how horizon, how sunset. A train passing through. I try to hug him through the spine. 
Left on the white space, his face becomes a mirror. If I stare long enough, my face, charcoal, pursed, squinting at the camera. Train horn, punch, shatters the mirror. Freeze him from the page. My uncle leaps from the if you haven't been following along, the poem just, just ends. Leaps from the, you don't know what, end of poem. So, uh, thanks for listening. Hi, y'all. Meek. This is a poem by Paul Tran, who's incredible. And I don't know that they have a collection now, I think they just finished their MFA. So hopefully it's forthcoming, because they're really excellent. When I saw this poem land in my email inbox, it was like, Paul was um, arrested in 2011 for aggravated assault against her husband in the snap. She was convicted in 2013 and is serving a life sentence in prison. Um, and the, the story that the court told is that she was an aggressive, angry woman who was out for vain revenge against her husband because he had the audacity to file for divorce against this woman. And the reality is that she was subjected to violence abuse and molestation as a child in Vietnam, and then later in her marriage to the man who's known only as Glenn, his identity is protected in all the court records. Um, so, this is a poem for Catherine Q. He forked a cube of tofu and stuck it in his pretty mouth. The sound of him chewing, clink of metal against the ceramic I later cleaned, have always cleaned, can already see me cleaning like the good wife I am. I listen to the ceiling fan, loud, then soft, then loud again, above us, its blades cleaving hot June air. Air so dry and mad that it ignited everything it touched. He'll remember this, his hand slamming down like a gavel when I said, his friend can't stay with us. When he said, divorce, when I said no, when he shoved himself away from the table, lifted his body, full of kindling and want for smoke, into the heat threatening the hills, casting its glare on little houses like ours, and went to bed because he needed to lie down. And I, still sitting where I was, where I've been all my life as a woman, thought how only part of everything he says is true. Lie down? No. My husband needed a lie. So I emptied his plate. I ran the hot water. I poured dish soap onto the sponge and began my immaculate work. Holy Mother, blessed Virgin. I waited for the ambient to kick in, for his ragged, roaring snores to disrupt my silent devotion. And then, only then, did I wash my hands. The judge said I was callous, calculated, cold. Like my husband, he only got some of it correct. I'm not callous. It was too hot to be cold. Calculated? Indeed. I counted. Each yard of a rope, each knot I tied, and then I tied the knot once more. I'm careful. Men don't appreciate that shit. Men like words like bitch, cunt. They say, honey, I'm home. Immediately a dog runs stupid, breathless to their feet licking the muck off their shoes. Did the prosecutor think about that when he demanded me for me a life sentence? Revenge, aggravated mayhem. My husband woke. I removed his pants. I took a 10-inch knife and hacked off his dick. I carried it into the kitchen. I almost kissed it goodbye. I remembered each time he forced it in me. Men who learn to be men from men never learn. You want me, man. You want whole, he whole for you. I shoved every inch of him, which wasn't much, into the garbage disposal. I turned it on. There was blood and skin and what sounded like a throat opening, choking, but of course no cum. There's hardly ever any. Pity. I should have known all those years ago when I mistook union for love and love for someone willing to push my hair away from my face in the dark 
when we turn back into animals, that marriage would be just that, two animals in a cage, starved for the other's meat. I'm not afraid of death. I have been born twice. First as Quayon, second as Catherine, saint of Alexandria, saint of the wheel, saint imprisoned and scoured until the streets ran red as my hands. I wiped my hands and re-entered our bedroom. There he was, crying. He cried the whole night. Whole? He'll never be whole again. <laughs> I'm going to read a couple of poems by Todd Kaneko. I'm still getting over a cold, so it's mm -hmm. nothing, no offense to Todd. It's, it's a real honor to read his work, not only for what he does as a writer, but for what he does over at Waxwing with Aaron and our other professor, Justin. And uh, thank you for everyone for being here and for Poem City. I read CNF for this issue, and it was a real honor to be able to see the talent that submitted. I'll quickly say that a couple of other things going on this week is Tomorrow night is the Poem City Celebration at Down Home Kitchen from 7 to 9, and there's going to be an open mic, so if you're listening now and you want to read some of your work tomorrow, you can do that. And then also this Thursday from 6 to 8 at um, North Branch Cafe, we'll be doing our monthly reading series, and there's also a chance there to not only hear the work of some current students, but to read some of your own work and write in response to a writing prompt. So maybe you're submitting it to issue 24 of Hunger Mountain whose theme is Patterns. So we're very excited about that. That opens on May 1st. So after we wrap up Poem City, send in your poems. But, uh, so I'm going to read from Todd Kaneko, and this isn't my work, so I hope I do an honor, and if I do mess up, we'll just get through. So this first one is on page 11, and it's called A Horse's Mouth, Mouse. And uh, I want to read it because of what it's doing with form. And you'll kind of see that not only if you follow along, but hopefully how I read it. So here we go. When the army brought us to the stables on our way to internment, they warned us about talking to the animals. We crowded into the stalls at night and listened to the horses explain the difference between sugar and blue, the weight of plow and cart, the jangle of spurs against bare flank, their mane sizzled blue, electric as they told us about silver riding the Lone Ranger back from the dead about man of war outracing death. They told us about Comanche, who survived the Battle of Little Bighorn, and then survived America, and we shuddered. Outside, the horses hurtled across the, across the landscape, from sea to shining shoreline, then back across the Badlands. Pegasus stirred the windstorm with ancient wings. Selepner struck lightning with all eight hooves against the prairie. Bahma broke a cobalt sky with Chinese fire while we hid our faces under thin blankets. The horses sang low songs for us, the blues for animals who were more than animals. The horses used our voices because the words did not fit in their mouths. When the horses were gone, the trucks took us to the internment camp. Question, what did the horses say? A, horses belong to the world. B. There are no horses, just smells of horses. C, we should not speak about these things. So I really like that. Um, I'll confess that's something I'm trying to do on a peace of mind, so that's why I wanted to spend a little time with it. Hope I did okay with some of that pronunciation, but um, it was nice to read it. And then the next one I'm gonna read, the last one, is on page eight. And uh, it's in couplets, a form that I like too. And it's all the things that make heaven and earth. The soil, the livestock, our memories of the war, everything flourishing before it vanishes, breath severed clean from our bodies, our shadows, sunset deepened and woven with dirt, whole family trees succumb to the blight. My grandfather returns to life, back still bent by history's quiet yoke, his memories of camp forever decaying into the tiny garden behind my house where my father's death is the soil, where silence blossoms now all year round, where the soil is my grandfather eating darkness, the spectral memory of camp that feasts upon my father and his father, me and my son. There are no such things as ghosts, I tell my son this every evening. 
as he gazes up the dark stairwell towards his room. What will be waiting for us when my boy is old enough to ask where he comes from? What will we find when our memories of camp finally molder back into the ground? Excited to hear Lizzie 
beatbox read her poems next. So um, I have two short poems for you um, by two different po poets. Um, the first one is um, by a poem by Amelia Martins. It's on the silent side on page 20. Um, and uh, this particular poet, she uh, lives with her family in um, Kentucky. And she wrote in her note when she submitted that um, she, these, this poem and others in the series has come out of her walks, um, uh, walking their two children uh, to elementary school each day. They live about half a mile away. And um, so they walk them to and from. And uh, so this is sort of to inspire you that poems can uh, come out of just walking around. Um, they can come from conversations or um, a blade of grass. So, um, morning walk, September 11th, 2018. Because you are five, I say airplanes crashed. And you say, where is our flag? And I say, look at those roses breaking open, little mouths on our walk to school. You scuff and work out the equation. If airplanes crashed on a surface like this, you drag the concrete, then there would be fire. Yes. And now I walk through a curtain of printer paper, a flock of fallen paper people, arms spread. Yes, I say, there was fire, and I mean is. And then the other one um, I just really love um, for the imagery. There's like this haunting, um, haunting images going through there. Uh, anyway, it's kind of that lingers. Um, this is on the power side, uh, page 18. The poet is named Jade Herder. Crystal vision with chrysalis. I wake in the middle of the night to whimpers. An angel shivers beside me, translucent as shadow. It vomits a chrysalis into my hand, sticky and green. Its red eyes ripple like pools. Where are the others? But the room contains only this small shadow, infinite in its softness. The mirror gluts with moon. If an angel dies, the silence becomes absolute. I tuck the angel inside my body. Its sickness is first a claw in my gut, then a dull purr. Inside the chrysalis, a tiny bell grows wings. Thank you. You see a wire 
a glimmer of light, a backlit lampshade, a shadow. A friend once gave a shadow puppet show in his living room, the paper cutouts, scissors snip precise and delicate, intricacies intended to channel the light exactly where he wanted it to shine. Eye socket, patterned shirt, in between strands of hair, highlights in the dark. Sometimes we are back in it. Take a heart as example, or shock pads and monitors, or just the sound of a voice. You don't see the current moving, but you know it's there. A connection to tend, to harness, to extend outward. You see the bodies you were given, its intricacies intended to channel the light exactly. You must. No, you'll cast a shadow. I have to flip the book over. <laughs> um, this next poem came, I was, you know when you just like scroll through Facebook and you find interesting articles and then you read them and they become poems. So, <laughs> that's part of my process. <laughs> so this came out of an article, I don't even remember where it was posted, um, but it was talking about how in the year 1860 when hoop skirts were becoming popular um, in fashion, um, there was this really terrifying pretty catastrophic combination of um, lighter fabrics for the first time, air underneath the skirt, right, without all the like many layers of petticoats, um, and, and oil lamps being the main method of lighting homes. <laughs> so um, according to this article, uh, uh, roughly 3,000 women were burned alive in their dresses that year in the United States. Just a lot of women. <laughs> um, and it got me thinking about um, all the ways that that might happen. Fashion, 1860. Ballerinas were particularly vulnerable. The tarlatan and gauze. But all girls who light like chimney fires, the bells of their hollow poop skirts funneling air up the legs. In the days of fireplaces and gas stage lamps, don't dance so close. 3,000 women burned that year, catching a hem, tipping a candle. The fabrics were spider webs and angels' gowns. The women dried out Christmas trees, needles dropping. Before household electricity, but mass-produced fabric meant every girl could leap like Emma Lidbury, see them at their mirrors, pretending, making pouty expressions with eyelashes spread, the slightest misgesture led to death. Ballerina skirts were longer then, and light, made to look like serifs. Everything was white, or lavender, or buttercup, and paid for by old male patrons championing his girl to the top of the playbill, once a whole row lit in formation. The one on the end, too close to the lamp. The other, too close to the girl beside her. A new dance began. The same dance when one sister rushed to the fireplace to put the other out. The trouble with hoop skirts was that women could move their legs. They burned down brownstones, apartment buildings, theaters, lost icons, lead dancers, soft faces, those long, carved wings. She was waiting for a casting call, stressed, sneaking a cigarette, had just gotten the tobacco lit when he approached. She'd insisted on warming the house with her husband gone to work and the children away. She needed the candle to find her bedchambers, brought it right into the room and cast light on her smile, her bodice, her undone button. She was facing the wall, about to breathe in, turned and tucked the flame quickly behind her back so he wouldn't see. You could almost hear the suck of air pulling inside and up. She brought the candle to her own bedside. Insisted on doing things alone, 
had the audacity to dance, was trying to help her sister. Uh, and I, I should have said before that Emma Livery, who's referenced in that poem, was a famous ballerina of the time who was, was burned on stage. Terrific manner. So let's we'll look at something later. <laughs> Um, this last poem is actually not in the book, um, but it will be on the website. So I thought I would read it as well, and folks should definitely thundermountain.org. <laughs> Check out thundermountain.org because um, I believe there's going to be several pieces going up, spoken word pieces in video form, which is really exciting. Yeah, we're taking that step. This is how to make art. Even when I'm sick, when I feel the thorn of a sore throat prick my right tonsil, and I purr through a stuffed nose while I dream of spilling my coffee because I'm stumbling through the house without opening the, my eyes because I can't open my eyes because I'm still dreaming and I'm late for work. I hear the robin's circular whistle at the window. Winter is always long, but the robin is back. Even when the weather won't stand still, when it throws my body into viral confusion with snowstorms and hailstorms and 60 degree winds all in one week, the robin is building her nest. The robin has work to do. She is sick. I think I wrote that last <laughs> for being here. Lucy has a poem. She's the only person that has a poem on both sides of the magazine. Um, and then I had heard Lizzie read that last poem, and then I invited her to submit to the magazine. And when she did, I couldn't not hear her voice in my head with that last poem. So I said, can we please put that one online and have two in the journal? And then I was like, well, can we put all three in mine? Um, and so as we start putting print, um, things for the print issue up on our online magazine, um, we're going to start with Lizzie, and so you'll be able to hear her read all three of those poems. And then once a week, we'll start putting up pieces from the print issue online. So, um, thanks for following along. If anyone wants to read from the issue, you certainly may. And if you want to take an issue home with you, they're twelve dollars, and you can come see any of the editors to take one of those with. Um, yay poetry! Yay April! <laughs> yay to that Robin, that persistent, <laughs> persistent Robin who gives me confidence and hope. Um, and thanks for being here tonight. <laughs> I want to read John Yes. Yay! Thank you. Oh, okay. Second time in Hunger Mountain, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. He, he and I were office mates at the oh. University of Missouri. <laughs> and when I told him, and when I told him I was moving to Vermont, he said, "Oh, you should check out Hunger Mountain. You really <laughs> like it." He was finishing his PhD, and I was teaching in the journalism department. I was teaching multimedia. So when I saw his poem in here, I was really excited. John Nieves, Long Dash. The first five days red yellow against the window shade. The water pressure barely knew its way through the pipes. We accordioned the hours on a damp queen with pale green sheets. It was always morning. The dew was always just leaving again for the sky. No one named us. No one spent a measure of breath trying to reach inside. 30 minutes from here, our lives went on without us. Most of our clothes holding only hangers, only drawer space. The lock firmly keeping the door, the air switching itself on and off. There, though, here, though, the starlings, the world look the <laughs> Here, though, the starlings, the wordless way our bodies say. Mm -hmm.